Hey everybody, uh, you're listening to 91.7 <coughs> WHUS uh, here on the campus of Stores. Uh, I am the Reverend Brian Blair. I'm the priest at St. Mark's Episcopal Chapel here on the campus. And I am with uh, my very next wonderful guest here on the show, Crossroads, uh, Professor Bradley Wright. Doctor, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Brian. All right, give me one second. How are you today? I'm doing well. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Well, we should turn your microphone on or it's no fun, is it? <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you could be with us. Um, the show asks people to discuss the intersection between their faith life and their everyday life. And I like to always start with what we do with our everyday life. So if you don't mind sharing, uh, can you tell us what you do here at UConn? So I've been here at the University of Connecticut for 23 years. I'm a professor of sociology in the sociology department. And I spend my time doing research and teaching and doing some administrative work. Uh, for the administrative work, I'm the director of undergraduate studies. For teaching, I teach social well-being mainly, and then also uh, methods, research methods. And then for research, I like to study how people construct purpose and meaning in their lives, but also how they can be helped to construct more of it. Do you have a name for the class that you teach? Yeah, it's actually social well-being. What exactly do you teach mm -hmm. if you're teaching social well-being? It's a good question. So well-being can take a lot of different flavors and forms. I tend to focus on what might be best described as positive social psychology. So there's positive psychology that people have heard of. What I do tends to be more, a little more social so we look at things like gratitude, self-control, um, and we look at things like willpower, we look at things like relationships and how society affects people, a uh, sense of well-being. So the well-being that we look at, the dependent variable, as it were, is are you happy? Do you have a sense of purpose and meaning? How are your emotions? And then we look at that in the social context. Is this in a lecture hall? It is. How many students do you typically get? Uh, well, I, the correct answer is as many as I want. Um, <laughs> so currently I'm teaching it with 70. Next semester I'll teach it with 200. It's interesting that you say, you know, it's going to more than double in size because as I listen to the description, I can see why students would love to take a class like that. What's the, what's the atmosphere in the class like? Oh, my students are great. They make for a great atmosphere. Um, Fun fact, I think I had the largest <laughs> class last spring oh. on campus because <laughs> I taught this class in Jorgensen. Okay. And you know, with social distancing and all. And that, that got me uh. thinking about the atmosphere of the class. But it tends to be very interactive mm -hmm. because people are talking about things they understand in their personal lives. It also tends to be very exploratory. I think a great way to, great way to learn is to have to discover for yourself. And so as much as I can, I try to give them problems to solve in their own lives mm. and by looking at other people's lives and making sense of them. When you say look at other people's lives, are you talking about like case studies that you give them or are you talking about human beings they might actually interact with? Uh, the latter mostly. So okay. I ask them to examine their own lives, examine the lives of the other people in the class, but also to examine people that they know of in their life. So like do a little mini study of your friends or your family or people you went to school with. It sounds like a really fun class. What are you hoping <coughs> students get out of it by the time they're done? And where I'm really going with the question is, how do you hope that that's going to have an impact beyond school? Oh, great question. And that's, that's a question that I want to be even more clear in my mind about. And it evolves across semesters. Right now, there's a couple things I want them to be able to do. At a sociological level, I want to teach them sort of rudimentary ways of doing research. So how do you create understanding by examining other people? In terms of well-being, I want them to understand what actually makes for a good life. What makes it so that you feel happy and that you feel contented, you feel satisfied, you feel a sense of meaning. Because it tends not to be what society says it is. Mm. If you turn on the TV, you'll see a commercial for Pepsi or Coca-Cola, they don't sell you sugar water. Mm. They sell you relationships. Mm -hmm. They sell you self-fulfillment, self-efficacy. They sell you all these things that sugar water doesn't give you. It just it makes you sick and it, it hurts your wallet and your teeth. 
So I want to give them a sense of what actually does <laughs> make those good things. It's funny you use uh, soda as the idea. I remember Mad Men, the series, was a really big deal. And the final episode of the series, the main character, they give credit for coming out with that Have a Coke and a Smile okay. ad campaign. And it's interesting that they ended an interesting exploration <coughs> of that kind of life by showing that this is how they're selling sugar water. Yeah. That you're going to smile because you're all going to come together and love one another. Exactly. So if we can understand what, really, what well-being really is and where it really comes from, mm. then I've equipped the students to pursue it in their own lives. And so pretty regularly after the semester, I'll get emails or letters from students saying, thank you so much. I'm talking about this with my roommates. I'm, I'm trying to live a more effective life. Or I'm trying to live a, a, a better life with a greater well-being and now I kind of know what to do. So it's part theory, but it's also part how-to. But you're not a psychologist. No, I'm not. So how do you move from sociology to what has a large element of psychology? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's not even just psychology. It also gets into economics mm. and philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, Within sociology, I'm very much at the social psychological end. Mm -hmm. So it's not that far of a reach for me. Right. I, most of my research I do with psychologists, and I, I did a two year postdoc with psychologists. Okay. So it's not completely foreign. Having said that, my treatment of a topic tends to take what psychologists and philosophers do, but then layer on a social aspect to it as well. So, you know, we'll talk about gratitude and we'll study things that you know, Bob Emmons out at Davis has done and who kind of pioneered the field. But then we'll talk about, well, how does gratitude come into play at the societal, societal level? And what in society makes us ungrateful? So I think it's the best of both, um, but maybe a student might think it's the worst of both, so. <laughs> you, know. you can only do what you can do. <laughs> so you mentioned gratitude in the beginning, and then you circled back to it mm -hmm. now. Uh, the person you're talking about, his name is Bob Edmonds? Edmonds, uh, E-M-M-O-N-S. E okay, and what kind of work is he doing that you enjoy so much? So he's the guy or the person who first figured out that gratitude could be manipulated or, or changed intentionally, and that could be used to study its effects. So in 2003, he published a big paper with another guy, and they basically got students to practice gratitude for a semester mm. and found out that their lives were different because of it. They were happier. They were more connected to others. They even exercised more. Oh, wow. That, Wait, which came first, the exercise or the gratitude? Well, that's the beauty of this approach. If you randomly assign gratitude, you answer that question. You know that you had half the... Half the students do gratitude mm. and half the students not. So the only difference between them was the gratitude practice. I see. And because of a sort of new way of seeing life, they decided they wanted to exercise? Okay, so that's a great question. What about gratitude would make you exercise more? I think, it's, I think that it taps into a general sense of energy and vitality and mm. engaging life. Mm -hmm. Because if things are going well, we're more comfortable acting with energy. You know, think of when you're upset about something. You don't want to exert yourself in any way. So I think it's kind of, kind of a cute little happenstance finding. But it just shows the power of gratitude that it could affect even exercise. This is a show that asks people to talk about faith. <coughs> and for lack mm -hmm. of a better term, because we've only got 25 <coughs> minutes, it's a kind of religious show. Mm -hmm. You're talking about gratitude, and you also use the word energy. Mm -hmm. When you say energy, what do you mean? Oh, I tend not to use that word in a spiritual sense. I tend to use it more just like emotional energy, mm -hmm. um, maybe closer to willpower, yeah. like you're able to act in what you want. So I'll give you an example. We had a, a get-together yesterday for my wife's uh, birthday. Are you sure you're allowed to talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. she turned tw 39, so, you know, it's okay. Um, <laughs> and... We had five couples over, and we had a great time. It's the first time we'd entertained since COVID okay. started. This morning, we were both exhausted. We uh, had very low energy levels uh -huh. because those are just really weak muscles. So I tend to use energy not in a spiritual sense, right. but more just uh, willpower and uh, 
uh, self-control, I guess. Do you believe in that Myers-Briggs concept that uh, an introvert sort of feeds <laughs> off of one thing and an extrovert feeds off of being around other people? Is that what happened? Uh, that could be. That could be. <laughs> You'd rather be in a corner reading a book rather than in a conversation with a dozen people? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. I've described myself as a raging introvert. Oh, um, well, we'll make the show as quick as possible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love interacting with people for about an hour a day. And yeah. the rest of the time, I just want to be by myself or oh. with my wife and just you know reading or studying or doing some hobby or something. Well, I'm very grateful for people like that in general because the well of... Uh, what one has to offer can sometimes be deeper, can oftentimes be deeper when they have taken the time to actually put the water in the well. So thank you very much, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> well, let's turn to uh, religion, if you will, faith, uh, because I think we sort of moved in that direction, wondering about things like gratitude and energy. Do you, would you mind sharing a little bit about who you are as a person of faith? Oh, sure. So I come at it from a number of different perspectives. I was raised in a Catholic family. Um, in high school, I got very involved with a student organization, a lot like Young Life. Mm. Uh, some people have heard that. College, I got involved with InterVarsity for five years. Uh, after college, I got involved in a couple different churches in Southern California and did the Southern California Christian scene. Got married, moved, or moved to Wisconsin, got married. And my wife and I, since we've been married, have um, attended Episcopal churches, Presbyterian churches, community churches, and currently I'm attending a small Catholic church out in the country. Mm. So... I tend to come at re religion within Christianity, but within Christianity from a number of different perspectives. As a Christian mm -hmm. of different perspectives, <laughs> how do you think that informed your decision to be in sociology? And then how do you think it helped you or influenced you to move in the direction you have moved in over these years? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Let me answer the second one first because I'm not sure about the first one. Hmm. Um, within sociology, I've always wanted to do things that I thought would make a difference, that would make the world a better place. So I started off studying homelessness and then crime, hmm. thinking, oh, if I understand it, then I can help make it better. I moved out of those areas once I stopped believing that understanding could make it better. I realized, oh, there's other things. If I want to deal with homelessness and crime, I really should get into politics as opposed to research. Um, so then I started studying religion and then got into purpose and well-being. But they're all expressions of basically wanting to do something that matters, that, that, that gives good to the world, um, that is of service. Now, that's not a uniquely Christian thing. There's plenty of people who do that who aren't Christians. But for me, it's rooted in Christian faith. Do you feel satisfied that you have been doing that? I feel satisfied that I've been trying. Um, haven't always been satisfied with the efficacy of it. So I feel that I've been attempting it. I'm just not sure if it's effective. And so that's why I'm constantly trying new ways of doing research, trying to think of what creates interesting knowledge, but also makes a difference in people's lives. When you, so we were on our way in before, mm -hmm. you got stopped by a handful of students. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned also that you, your class seems to be an enjoyable one. Mm -hmm. Does that count as giving you a sense that uh, you're moving in the right direction? That's absolutely in the, in the plus column. Okay. So uh, the two students I met are, are both great. One I work with in research, the other's in my social well-being class. Mm. And I mean, it's such a treat working with students. Uh -huh. Although it's a little bit um, discombobulating. <laughs> Every year I get older, but uh -huh. my students never get older. They're yeah. always 18 to 22. <laughs> And so it's this weird thing where I feel there's a little bit of a groundhog day in terms of age. Right. And then every once in a while, I'll reconnect with a student after 10 or 15 years, and they'll have, like, gray hair. I'm like, how can that happen? I thought <laughs> students are always, you know, young. I'm reminded of a funny movie called This is Spinal Tap. I don't oh, know if you've I ever adore seen it. it. Uh, I can quote on. it. Exactly. Well, then you are a superb human being. I'm looking for dials that I go up to 11 so. in the radio station Ex as we I'm talk. sure there's one here. But there's that wonderful part in the interview with the bass player where he talks about being in an arrested state of development, like the moose in the <laughs> National Park. And when you talked about that idea of the students, that's the first that came to mind. You don't feel like you're in an arrested state of development, do you? Oh, uh, depends on the day, maybe. No, <laughs> no sir. I, um, we, 
So as a person of faith, you strike me as trying to always move and grow, mm -hmm. but not yet feeling 100% satisfied. Do you have a sense of what else might lay ahead that would make you feel a bit more satisfied? Well, that's a great question. I, I can see why you're a pastor and a successful <laughs> pastor at that. Um, so is it Donald Rumsfeld said there's the, the known unknowns mm. and the unknown unknowns. <laughs> there's what we know that we don't know, but then there's the things that we don't know that we don't know. And it's the unknown unknowns. He wasn't talking about spiritual well-being. Was <laughs> no, he was talking about <laughs> warfare. Um, but I thought that was a useful distinction. Mm. And over time, my acceptance of there being unknown unknowns has right. increased. Okay. So I guess I would say there's some things I know that I need as far as growing. I assume, based on past experience, that there's a far, far more things that I don't know that I need that will that I'll encounter, or you know maybe I won't. But that that there'll be issues or questions or struggles that will arise, and when they do, I'll think oh, that's exactly what I need to grow both as a person, a person of faith, and also as a sociologist, somebody trying to make a difference in the world. Everything that I hear in what you're saying is very positive. Mm -hmm. And I see that you wrote a couple of books mm -hmm. about sociology and Christianity. And the titles are each very mm -hmm. positive in their tone. I wondered if you wouldn't mind sharing for a minute about those books. Sure. The titles and what was behind everything. So the second book was Upside, Surprising Good News About the World, and that was about societal conditions. But the first book, which really uh, targets in, or is really targeted by your question, is um, Christians are hate-filled hypocrites, dot, 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 and other lies you've been told. Mm. So a couple things about titles. When you work with a publisher, <laughs> you get page one through page whatever, but you don't get the f covers. Mm. So the cover, the, the publisher picked that cover. Having said that, they picked a great title, um, or the publisher also picks the title. Uh, I thought it was a great title. It's, it's more creative than I would have come up with, certainly. Mm. There you are being positive again. <laughs> <laughs> My take on Christianity and the negative talk about it is that it's an artifact of societal incentives to talk negatively about Christianity. So let's say you're a journalist and you want to write about something to do with religion. Okay, your career as a journalist does better if your stories are published and if they're published toward the front of the paper. Mm -hmm. If you can be above the fold on the front page, you're doing great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then... Even in the digital world. Yeah, even in the digital world. Maybe even especially in the digital world. Mm. So then the question becomes not what is true or right or meaningful or beautiful, but rather what will get people's attention. Now, Are you well, criticizing capitalism? Huh? I don't even know if it's capitalism. I don't want to distract you. I couldn't help the joke. It's, um, <laughs> I think it's human nature. Yeah. Um, I tend to be pretty tough on the media, if mm -hmm. anything. Um, so then you look for problems. So let's say in the state of Connecticut, or let's say there's 450,000, 500,000 churches in the country. I think it's, that's about right. Mm -hmm. Most of them have a pastor. Some of them have multiple pastors. By and large, those men and women are tremendous positive assets to their communities. They're out doing good. They're like, like what you're doing, out trying to meet people, do good things, feed the poor, talk about what's right, connect people with relationships. But that's not newsworthy. If you have a pastor who wakes up in the shopping cart covered with, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, whipped cream outside a sorority one morning. I've never heard of that. Uh, <laughs> then suddenly that's front page news. Right. So it really is a selection bias mm -hmm. of what's newsworthy. It's like airplanes. Air, air travel is safer per mile than car travel. Mm -hmm. But if a plane goes down, that's when we hear about it. So lots mm -hmm. of people are frightened of it. So I would say the negativity that we experience is primarily based on people in the media trying to advance their careers and that's their incentives. Also advocates, people who want to do good things. Mm get your attention by speaking negatively. So pastors speak very negatively of Christianity because that's a way of getting people's attention to, to, to get them to listen to your sermon, to buy your book, to attend your seminar. Mm. 
So it's incentivized negativity. How's that for a nice little phrase? That's great. But when, so by the time we're done reading that book of yours, what are we supposed to walk away from? You're supposed to walk away with a sense of skepticism of the negativity you hear, mm. a greater willingness to trust your own experience, and also a sense that in many ways things are going pretty well within Christianity. Well, it's nice of you to write a book like that. <laughs> well, I didn't start <laughs> off wanting to write that book. I wanted to write a book about the data. Oh, wow. But the data kept on leading me there. The da so the data leads you there. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of data did you pick up? What got me into this is when I started studying the sociology of religion, I heard the statistic uh, many times in popular Christianity that Christians are more likely to be divorced than non-Christians. Mm. But then I started looking at research articles on it, and that was not the case. Mm -hmm. And within Christianity, people who go to church often get divorced much less than people outside of Christianity, mm -hmm. or people who don't have faith, uh, a religious faith. So I thought, why is that? And I found out that there was a, a Christian marketer who had made his career um, basically scaring Christians about their immorality, and this was one of his favorite statistics. It just happened to be wrong, but either no one knew or no one cared. So then it's not a statistic. What is a statistic? It's just a, a wrong statistic. I mean, statistics can be bad. Like I can say um, <laughs> uh, one-fourth of Episcopalian uh, Episcopal priests shave their heads. Uh -huh. That is a statistic. I just have no idea if it's right. Mm. Okay. You're the professional. <laughs> <laughs> So you wrote that one, but I saw two titles that were very positive. What was the other one? The other was um, Upside Good News About, uh, Surprising Good News About the State of the World. And the first book hit pretty, pretty solidly. It, it got a wide audience. The second book, it came out during the Great Recession. Mm. And it was about how things are getting better in society. Mm -hmm. It was true, but no one cared. Uh, just about anything you look at in society is getting better. Yeah. But we only hear about the bad things. And once something bad gets good, you don't hear about it anymore. So when I was younger, the ozone layer, that's all people talked about. Now, yeah, you don't hear about it so much. Mm -hmm. Air pollution, that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now you don't hear about it so much because it's gotten so much better. So again, it's um, sociologists who study this look at um, social problems and they call it the culture of fear. That mm -hmm. there's a lot of actors in society who have strong incentives to make us afraid. Right. It's not just religion, it's about everything. Right. Well, you talked about gratitude earlier, and I'm thinking of this concept of making people live in fear, and I would say dot, dot, dot for profit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What happens if you have a society full of people full of gratitude? That's a great question. The s cynic would say, that nobody's lives would be, that there'd be more exploitation and there'd be um, less advancement, that fear, that fear and condemnation and, and criticism is valuable. We need to be afraid to make things better. I would say that if people were more grateful, they'd be more engaged in their lives, they would treat other people better, they would be healthier. Lot, there have been hundreds of studies on gratitude and almost always they find that gratitude makes people's lives better. I think when I wonder about that, it takes a degree of courage to take that kind of leap of faith, and mm -hmm. there's no pun intended. It's the idea that if you can be full of gratitude and be on board hoping that everybody else is full of gratitude, then altogether it heals these kinds of issues that we're touching on but if you can't be courageous enough to sort of take that leap of faith, then everyone's just going to live in fear, and that's the end of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds right. Oh, well, it's your show, not <laughs> mine. Um, how much time do we have here? We're having a great time. I lost track of time. Uh, well, so if you, um, you're teaching a lot about the idea of purpose and meaning, mm -hmm. which is deeply spiritual. I was wondering if you could talk to us for a minute about the difference between purpose and meaning. Okay. Different people use the words differently. Some people use them synonymously. I take the lead of Michael Steger, who uh, does a lot of research on these topics. He defines meaning as the broader category, and it basically signifies that something matters to you. 
If something's meaningful, it matters, it's significant. Purpose is a subset of that. Purpose is the things in your life that matter, that you're going to act on, that sort of point, serve as a compass to move you forward. What happens when people don't feel a sense of purpose and or meaning? It's not good. It's, <laughs> it's not good. Um, people, studies have, uh, studies have looked at the effect of purpose. One study looked at middle-aged people, measured their sense of purpose in life, followed them for 17 years, came back 17 years later to see where they were at. Having a sense of purpose predicts lower mortality rates. Mm. It's estimated to increase life uh, longevity by like five years. And if you think about it, if you have a sense of purpose, you're active, you're engaged, just all these things can make your life better. So purpose, I think, is more important to pursue than even happiness. And I'm a big believer in pursuing happiness. You know, that is interesting. We talk a lot about happiness. And I do wonder sometimes if happiness is really the ultimate goal mm -hmm. versus something like purpose, rather. And part of that comes from wondering about what people will do when they retire. Mm -hmm. So what has anybody ever looked at what happens with retirement and making sure that we feel a sense of purpose? Mm -hmm. I tend to focus on purpose at the start of life rather than the end of life, mm. but it's an equally, it's a salient then as it is at the start. My impression, and this is just based on people I know in my life, is that purpose is essential for thriving in retirement. Um, my grandfather lived a very purposeful life as a surgeon, mm. retired, didn't have anything to do. Um, got into behavioral problems, and he died not longer, long after that. Mm -hmm. Whereas people I know who have a sense of purpose with their retirement, um, you know a guy who retired f from being a database administrator, he went to work for Compassion International as a volunteer. He, he's in his mid-70s. He's more active than I am. Um, so I think it, having a sense of like a third act in your life mm -hmm. or after retirement is essential for not dying quickly and sadly. It's interesting as you describe that. I'm thinking about people who are in addiction programs like AA, for example, mm -hmm. and just the idea of knowing you have to get up and go to a meeting and being accountable to a group of people for a lot of people in programs like AA keeps them healthy. I think you're right. Okay. Well, um, last question here. We're almost done with time. Actually, I think we are done with time. How about this? Let's say you were on the radio and you were you and you wanted to leave everybody with something on a radio show where we ask people to talk about the intersection of their faith life and their everyday life. What do you think would be important to leave people with? I'll give you a statement that is both true empirically and metaphysically. Mm. If, you search for if you search for purpose, it will find you. I like it. It sounds like something else I've read somewhere. Very similar. I'm so glad we got this time to talk. Uh, you've been great. I really appreciate uh, all your time. Everybody, we have been talking here on Crossroads with Professor Bradley Wright, and I wish everybody a wonderful day for the rest of your day. Uh, this is 91.7 WHUS, and you have been listening to Crossroads. Did you know one? I liked it.